beautiful. It's Miss Tony, and you're joining me on week 34 of my 40 year old pregnancy journey. Thanks again. Always grateful to have you. Thanks for tuning in. This week, the baby is the size of a pineapple. So that's about 18 inches long. And my babies are usually born around 20 inches. So <laughs> that's scary. I only got two more inches, and the baby is going to be like my version of full term. Um, and the baby is about five pounds, two ounces now. So I told you guys I had my two doctor's appointments this week. I was so ecstatic to be able to see both of my doctors. Um, sadly, this was my last appointment with my perinatologist. As you guys know, when you're considered high risk, then your doctor will often recommend that you also have care from a maternal fetal medicine doctor or better known as a perinatologist. And they specialize in high risk pregnancies. So y'all know I'm considered AMA, advanced maternal age for pregnancy. Once you hit 35, you get pushed in that category and being AMA and being black um, and now being 40, I keep hearing all these ands and ands and ands. I'm like, okay, y'all, <laughs> I get it. High risk, I get it. Anyway, once you've been categorized as high risk, then you see a second doctor, but you don't see them as frequently. So um, I've seen this doctor just a few times during this pregnancy and usually it's about once each trimester um and so now it was kind of bittersweet for us to to meet for the last time especially since this is my last baby and so he is the doctor that took care of me for all three of my pregnancies so on another not so exciting note but a very informative note i told you guys last week that I was going to speak to both of my doctors about their opinions about that perinatal conference that I attended uh, where I learned some information. So I'm going to share with you guys real quickly some of that information that I um, learned during that perinatal advisory council uh, conference. So uh, there were two, there was the County of LA Public Health that um, presented and then um, a couple of the local hospitals that specialize in perinatal health also a couple of the local children's hospitals as well presented some data too. So we had uh, a lot of doctors um, with a lot of medical research and they reported some CDC information, they reported some US Census information, and then they reported some of their own medical data. So first slide talks about maternal mortality. Nobody wants to talk about that, but um, it's a real issue. And um, I wanted to show you guys this bar graph really quickly because you can see the orange, right? The orange is black, black women. The other colors are white, Hispanic, Asian, and then LA County as a whole. So surprisingly, LA County even as a whole is very low. This is maternal mortality in LA. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not a medical expert, but when I learned this information, um, I just want to share it with you all just so you have that knowledge as well. Not to instill fear or anything like that. There is no fear here. And I just want to be clear on that, but just to share some of the data behind some of the information that I've learned just over the course of my career, over the course of my pregnancies and um, some insights that may be helpful for you to know as well. So they talked about like what are what explains the pattern. They were trying to find out if it was genetics, education, healthcare access, and believe it or not, it was none of those things. As I shared last week, they had showed this one study um, with African women versus Black women in America, and you there was no correlation that showed that there were any genetic factors that led to either stillbirths in Black mothers or maternal deaths which means, of course, women who die in childbearing. There is no answer to the riddle. All they try to do is come up with different types of management. They're still doing a lot of research, um, but I just mentioned stillbirth. So that was what I've talked about last week. It says the risk of stillbirth in women 40 to 44 at 39 weeks was identical to the risk of stillbirth in women 25 to 29 years of age at 42 weeks craziness. So a woman who went beyond her due date, she was only in her 20s, mid 20s, that rate of stillbirth is the same as a woman who is in her early 40s and who had her baby early at 39 weeks. Insane. No explanation. 
But the reason I brought that up is because I had not heard that second bullet point before. I had ne never seen that type of data. And so I couldn't wait this week to go to both of my doctors so that I could have the discussion with them as to their opinions as far as me being um, not only African-American, but being age 40, um, did they think that I needed to be induced before 39 weeks? And so I talked to Dr. Lee, that's my perinatologist, right before um, he left the room. I was like, oh, I meant to ask you. I almost forgot y'all, but I was like, I meant to ask you. I went to this conference, heard this data, want to know your opinion. And he was like, oh, absolutely. Like he said it like it, he, it wasn't a thought. He's like, oh, you absolutely should be induced. Like I absolutely, I know the data. I've seen that data for years now. And he's like, I completely agree um, that you should be induced. And I was like, okay, doctor, my other doctor hasn't brought that up to me. No one's brought that up to me. Um, you know, and I'm 34 weeks now. I'm very close to being before 39 weeks and no one's had this discussion with me. So he's like, well, I will confer with your doctor um, to see if she will accept my recommendations. But he said, I'm recommending that. Like I'm formally recommending um, two things that you get induced before 39 weeks. And secondly, that you have a non-stress test for the baby once you hit the 36 week mark. And I had no idea what that was. So I was like, um, I didn't do that with my last two pregnancies. So why am I doing that now? And he said, well, because of your special age, <laughs> which I thought was cute. I was like, okay. Um, because I was 30, I think I was 34 when I was pregnant with Kennedy, I was 34 turning 35. And then with Cameron, I was 37. And so I wasn't at the 40 year old mark yet. So I didn't have to do any of those stress tests and I didn't have to do, uh, you know, any planned induction due to my high risk category. But because I am now 40, there's a whole nother high risk category that I didn't even realize. And so he he's like those are the two recommendations I'm making and I'll be sure to chart that right now and then you'll talk to your doctor he's like when are you gonna see her and I said I'll see her that tomorrow was the next day so he said okay I'll be sure to put that in your chart today then and then she'll see it and you guys need to have that discussion and if she goes by my, my recommendations then yes you'll be induced and you'll start to do stress tests in two weeks so y'all know how I feel about doctors. Y'all know I work in the medical industry and I completely respect doctors, but what I'd call their medical practice is that medical practice. And so I just walked away thinking like, if I didn't bring that up, would he have? Cause again, no one has brought this conversation to my attention before I brought it to him on his way out the door of my last appointment with him. And he's the high risk doctor. So, while I was on cloud nine about this sonogram, I was a bit frustrated as I was walking out the door because now I have to have this conversation with my OB and see if she's gonna accept this recommendation and she hasn't brought it up yet either. So I go to see her next the next day and she's not there. So I had to see her nurse practitioner because my doctor was uh, doing someone's surgery at the time and I love my doctor. I just love that she is so specialized because she has a lot of knowledge and I truly respect her opinion. So I was hoping that she was going to be on the same page because what do you do if your two doctors don't agree? You know what I mean? Like you the patient have to make a decision and I honestly in this case didn't want to be the one to have to make that decision. I just wanted to take his opinion, this information that I learned on my own at this perinatal conference, fuse that together and if she agreed then we could just move forward but she wasn't there. So I ended up having an appointment with the nurse practitioner and the nurse practitioner, they're not at the level where they can give you that kind of recommendation. So when I see my doctor um, in a little bit over a week, then I'll be able to follow up with her at that point about her opinion. And I will say my nurse practitioner did look at my chart and she said, oh, I do see Dr. Lee's notes here. So she saw that he had already put everything into the computer system and it had already translated over to them before my appointment. So I was like, okay, he's on it. And so she said, when your doctor returns, then we'll be able to um, have that follow up conversation. And if your doctor is in agreement with him, then yes, we will plan to, to induce you before the 39 week mark. And y'all I'm at 34 weeks. So <laughs> that's not giving me a lot of time. Um, but she's like, to be honest with these contractions that you're having, once I explained to her, like I finally did time them. My doctor told me to start timing them. So she said, with these contractions you've been having, in addition to the Braxton Hicks every day, 
we may not even have to induce you at, you know, 38, 39 weeks. She's like, this baby's probably going to come, especially it's not your first baby. This is your third baby. She's like, the baby's probably going to come early anyway. So I was like, really? She's like, yeah. So she's like, we may not even have to worry about this whole follow the recommendation thing. She said, you probably will um, start to do your stress test at the hospital um, in the next week or so just to be on the safe side, which I asked the, I asked the nurse, like, what is that? And basically it's just, um, I'm going to have to go to the hospital twice a week and they're going to do monitoring of the baby. And it's, um, something that they could have done in the office. I think they got rid of the machine that they used to use to, to do the, the stress tests. So I'll have to go to the hospital now and I haven't registered yet. So I need to go to the hospital anyway, which if you guys don't know what that is, that's just the process of uh, pre-registering before you have your baby. So when you show up, they're not asking you questions when you're freaking in labor <laughs> and you're like, I don't know my middle name. Like, I don't know anything right now. I just know pain. <laughs> So uh, you pre-register with all your information, your insurance, emergency contact, like all that good stuff. And they give you a card. At my particular hospital, it's just a little pink card. And with COVID, it may be electronic now, who knows. Um, but it's just something that you, instead of you walking in and having to have a whole conversation, you just present the card and they have your information in the system. And you just bypass all that um, in the admitting department and you go right into either emergency. So if you deliver on a weekend, you're, for my hospital, um, the, the doors are closed. The regular hospital is closed on the weekends. And so if you deliver during the uh, night where it's after hours or if it's the weekend, then you have to go through the emergency entrance, which is on the back side of my hospital. Um, if you come during the regular weekday, during the regular hours of operation, then you can just come through the regular front door and they'll va valet your car for you. So it's just interesting um, <laughs> to, you learn all that like during the end and you're like, oh, I got to register. Okay, let me do that. Um, the good thing is when you have had a history with the hospital, then they don't need as much information the next time around. They just want to know if your insurance changed and um, some basic information like that. But as far as your um, health records and all that, they have it all um, because my doctor is a part of that hospital system. So it's all correlated. It's all in the same system. So it's very convenient. And so I'm going to have to register next week when I go there for the first time for my first stress test. And thankfully, I'm actually going on maternity leave, y'all. So we've talked about that in these videos too. Um, in California, you get to go on your leave four weeks prior to delivery. And it's called California Pregnancy Disability. And so I have applied for my company short-term disability and I've applied for the California Pregnancy Disability. I just did all that this week. And so everything's pending. Well, that's it for week 34 of my 40 year old pregnancy journey. I appreciate you joining me. If you haven't subscribed, then please do so. I hope this information is helpful and insightful for you. I hope you can walk away learning something new every time. Um, but also I hope that you just enjoy being on this journey with me. I appreciate all the support. Um, I, I appreciate all the comments and um, you guys are following me on IG as well. So I appreciate the inboxes, the DMs, and um, just all the support that I've been getting for sharing this journey with you guys. I started it as just a personal diary thing. I just wanted to be able to document my final pregnancy and uh, didn't know it was gonna come to this. So it's exciting to be able to share it with you. I have a lot of uh, family members who watch regularly because they can't see me. Um, we're again, we're coming out of COVID, thank the Lord. But um, I haven't seen my family in over a year. So this has been a way for my family to connect with me. Um, they haven't seen me pregnant. <laughs> my mom has not seen me pregnant, y'all. And she was with me with both the other pregnancies. And so that's been tough not having my mom, not having my sister, who was my best friend, Regina J. Um, she's been supportive through both of my pregnancies as well. But um, this time she hasn't been able to actually be with me. She and my sister-in-law, D hosted my... Um, first baby shower in my hometown in Detroit. Um, they also hosted my gender reveal with the second baby in Detroit. And so this time I'm not having anything there because I'm here and the traveling restrictions are just being lifted now, which is great, but it's too late for me to travel. If you guys don't know, you can't travel this late in your pregnancy. And so um, there's too high of a chance once you hit, I think it's the 34, 
four thirty four. Oh, the different airlines have different requirements. Um, so some of them will say like the third trimester and then others will say like 34 weeks, 35 weeks or 36 weeks um, is the last point that you can actually fly on the airline. So they're very restrictive. Of course, if you wanted to, you could probably, if you could hide your belly, then you could try, but uh, they just don't want to take that risk of you having a baby on a plane and they have to ground the plane. <laughs> like who wants that? Anyway, I can't fly. It's too late for me to, to hop on a plane um, to see my family now that their travel restrictions are up. But my family, some of them are going to come out and just a few of them are going to come out and see us uh, once the baby is born um, within the next few weeks or so. And so that'll be fun. And then I've got some friends who are going to wait a couple months till the baby's a little bit older. And then um, in the fall, they're going to come as well. So I'm thinking about doing a sip and see. If you guys haven't heard of what those are, it's it's a old country down south thing. Um, where they used to have people just come sip whatever you want to sip so lemonade or some strong drink and come see the newborn baby so for this being baby number three there's all you know there's all these questions about whether or not you should have another um baby shower because that's greedy especially if you can afford to get your own stuff then you should get your own stuff so that's just my personal opinion but everyone's different um so that's what i was thinking of having a sip and see as opposed to an actual shower just so people can actually come and meet the baby still get to see the baby when it's maybe maybe a couple months old and um get to still celebrate with us in person so we'll see if we're able to do something like that with our uh, small groups of our family um this fall so i can't let you guys leave without seeing my 34 week belly bump i gotta show y'all this is funny so look how high the baby is this is super high because the bottom of my pelvis is way down here but the baby is way up here, just in this little area bunched up right here. So that's probably why I've been out of breath so much lately. Because the baby is so high up by my lungs and my ribs. And just poking out right there. Been like that for the past day or two. But eventually the baby will drop. Which means instead of y'all seeing this bump up here, you're going to see it way down here. So this will be a little. And then this will be big. <laughs> That's when you know baby is ready and on their way out because they have dropped so far down in your pelvic area. So uh, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there, y'all. Thanks again for joining me and I can't wait to see you next week.